recap of Truth and Generosity, I would like to go over Colin McGinn's blog post. Uh, he's written a blog post called The Principles of Radical Interpretation. And he criticizes Donald Davidson's version of the principle of generosity, uh, which uh, Davidson calls the principle of charity. Um, but I think that Colin's criticisms will help to throw your version into relief. So Colin says, suppose I encounter an alien tribe in the deepest jungle and present members of the tribe with a cell phone. And suppose they've never seen a cell phone or any other electronic device. Clearly, they will not form the belief that the object in front of them is a cell phone. They have no such concept. They have no beliefs about cell phones or any similar technology. It would be absurd to appeal to the principle of charity in ascribing such beliefs to our natives. Perhaps what they believe is that the thing they are holding is a piece of a star fallen from the sky. You say, cultural differences come to light only against a background of transcultural understanding. Is there anything you'd like to elaborate on there? My thought is you begin with nouns. Mm -hmm. You pick up, uh, I don't know why you would pick up a cell phone, but you would pick up something common and say... And start from there. Start yeah. from the easy stuff. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes it is suggested that the principle of charity should be amended to a principle of humanity, which prescribes that we should ascribe the beliefs we would form if we were in the epistemological position of the native. Thus, if the native is presented with a visual illusion, not known by them to be such, we should ascribe the false belief appropriate to that illusion, not the true belief that we have in knowing about the illusion. But this won't help with the cell phone case, because presenting the native with a fake cell phone will not warrant assigning to them the belief that the object is a cell phone, as opposed to a fake cell phone, for again, they have no such concept. Why are we dealing with illusions? <laughs> yeah, it seems like a bad start. <laughs> yeah. The principle of generosity is not the only principle that guides interpretation, but it is an absolutely essential component in understanding equivocal language. This does not mean that the most generous interpretation is always correct. So I think that answers to a lot of the, the issues that he brings up here. It only means that all else being equal, and there is usually much else, the generous interpretation is the most likely. Okay. Um, so I'll go on uh, to Collins' post again. What if they are presented with a familiar object, say a rabbit? A rabbit. Should we say they believe it is a rabbit, thus sharing our belief? Not necessarily, since they may have beliefs about the animal in front of them that excludes them from having the zoological concept rabbit. They may believe of rabbits, that they are gods and not animals. They do not share our beliefs about rabbits. The problem is that they believe this is a god, not an animal, and hence they don't apply the concept of rabbit to the thing in question. Yeah. So it seems to me that if these people think rabbits are gods, they have to first think they're rabbits. And so they have to be with us to identify the rabbits that they think are also gods and we don't. Mm -hmm. that, yeah, we have, to, we have to both understand what yeah. is being called a god. That, that, yeah. Right, so the principle of generosity applies to naming rabbits. I mean, not giving them names like Foo Foo and Pee Pee. Right. But... <laughs> <laughs> Pee Pee the Rabbit. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let me finish up with the, the quote though. Um, the problem is they don't, the problem is that they believe that this thing is a god, not an animal. And hence they don't apply the concept rabbit to the thing in question. Maybe they have the concept rabbit and apply it to certain kinds of rabbit only. When it comes to white rabbits, say, they withhold the concept since these creatures they take to be gods, not animals, and hence withhold the co rabbit concept. So we can't describe a belief to them based on what we believe. We can't use ourselves as the yardstick of their beliefs since they differ radically from us about what the world contains. Why is that any different from saying that 
Some kind of cars are fast cars, but most aren't. And we can explain that they're both cars, but some are very fast. They're gods. <laughs> Chapter 10, Radical Interpretation. Uh, say, we imagine Donald in an open field with a native. As a rabbit runs by, the native Pepsi lifts his foot in its direction and utters the sound gavagi. Does gavagi mean rabbit? Or does it mean mammal, hopping creature, furry creature, or cute little thing? It could also refer to the grass, the trees beyond, or perhaps the flower that was near the rabbit at the moment of speech. And what about the gesture? It does not have to be equivalent to our pointing. It could mean, I want to kick that thing, or run for it, or I want to urinate, <laughs> or here comes dinner, and so on. Presumably, he will ultimately have to utter Gavagi himself and see what the native does. Nevertheless, his interpretive endeavor cannot even begin without the presupposition of a lot of shared beliefs. The ability to highlight moving objects over stationary ones involves many more baked in assumptions and beliefs, some as fundamental as how we see motion through space, how we think about time and sudden change, how we understand presence, negation, normality, along with other concepts, some of which may be even more fundamental than these. What it says is, before we start talking about the meanings of words, we better have a lot of language in common. Right. There's a lot that we assume yeah. that we might not even be aware of assuming. Yeah. And then here's another one, and I think you've addressed this one as well. Um, he says, what if they are convinced skeptics who never believe that anything they experience is real? So we're talking about some, something more like Cartesian skepticism. And you address that in your chapter, uh, Trust and Doubt, chapter eight, uh, where you talk about the problem of knowledge and the problem of error, and you compare Parmenides and Descartes. Um, and you make it clear that the principle of generosity applies most clearly and straightforwardly to cases where the object in question is directly present. You say, for what is not present, we have the problem of knowledge. For what is present, right here before us, we have the problem of error. And then you go on to say, this should not be taken to mean that knowledge of this sort can give Cartesian skepticism the answer it demands. The point is merely that absence explains error and presence makes a mystery of it, which has implications in the chapter where you do the thought experiment on the origins of language. He says, Colin, and the same point applies to radical interpretation directed inwards. We also seek to discover what goes on in our unconscious. We need a way to figure out what beliefs and desires exist there. For the sake of concreteness, let's accept a Freudian account of the unconscious. How shall we find out what we unconsciously think and feel? One view would be that we should use a principle of charity. We unconsciously think and feel what we consciously think and feel. But what is striking about Freud's unconscious is how much it is supposed to differ from our conscious life. So charity would get things quite wrong. Instead, we need to adopt a more circumspect and holistic approach, appealing to free association, dreams, neuroses, jokes, slips of the tongue, and the early family dynamic. Using a principle of generosity will not do justice to the variety of minds, the basic assumption of that principle is that there is uniformity of the mental across all peoples and all types of mind. We all believe and desire pretty much the same things. So we could generalize the principle of charity into a principle of uniformity. All minds are pretty much the same, the same as ours, that is. Look, he wants to use the Ford in. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you say, I have an unconscious desire to kill my mother and my father, and sleep with, sleep with my mother. Right. That, yeah. What's the problem? Uh, I'm saying there's an unconscious desire. It, it's, it's my it's unconscious opinion that that will lead to happiness. <laughs> Not my mother's, I guess. <laughs> or my father's. But mine. And so I say... But how are you using the principle of generosity? I don't know who I am. I, 
So you just don't think you think I have to use it every time I open my mouth. (laughs) Okay. So you're saying it doesn't apply then when you're talking about that? I'm not sure what's being said here, so I don't know. But but I I would say that, of course, every time you say anything, you're not using generosity. Right. Because you're limiting the principle of generosity to um, background set of basic assumptions, not to every single belief that we say. I guess so. He says, projecting our own mind into the mind of the alien other is not the way to further human understanding. And a reader made a similar comment. You said, Davidson argues that we cannot recognize as language that which we cannot interpret. And the reader asks, what does it mean here to recognize a language? We recognize animals communicate without interpreting their language. Information complexity and structure might tell us we're seeing a language even if we can't translate it. Who says we can't understand animal language? This is the reader. Well, I, I believe that the reader is wrong. If a cow moves in a certain way, and every time he moves in that way, he goes over and gets a drink of milk. No, he wouldn't drink milk. <laughs> Water, water, yeah. like hay. Uh-huh. I think we can say that that's language. And or communication. And saying something like, I want hay. Mm-hmm. So we can interpret animals. I think we can. I think so, too. I interpret Geordie all the time. Don't we? Yeah. Isn't it? Yeah. Isn't that the natural thing? We don't look at them as completely mysterious no. objects who just no. wander around. They have their own little way of communicating with each other by sniffing each other's butts and all things that. Like so that. <laughs> we can't do that. We don't want to do that. <laughs> okay, let me finish the question. Um, information, complexity, and structure might tell us we're seeing a language even if we can't translate it. Could we con- conclude aliens were more or vastly more intelligent or beyond our ken? And I responded in the comments section. It's not that we have to have translated a language to recognize it as a language, but that it must be translatable in principle. And uh, I'm not entirely sure that I responded to the question, um, are you saying that the very act of acknowledging a language or a conceptual system entails seeing it as, in principle, interpretable? I think my answer is yes. To know that it's a language is to provide at least a translation, a translation for at least some of it. And whatever is necessary for translation would have to be there. Arising at the same time as recognizing the language. Yeah, I think think so. I mean, it seems so obvious. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I'll move on to the next question. Oh, let's go home. Let's go home. We are home. (laughs) Dinner. One reader asked, are the links between language and reality as intimate as the thesis suggests? Yes. (laughs) Does a willful violation of the principle of generosity amount to a willful rejection of reality? Now here he was talking about politics, but I wanted to make the question broader. Um, If you reject if you don't use the principle of generosity in certain circumstances, you're not going to come up with whatever the, guy, whatever the person thinks. If that's what you want, then go ahead and do it, and you'll be misrepresenting what he says. In areas where the facts are slippery, there is great divergence mm-hmm. in opinion about what to do. And precisely. There's room for such divergence precisely because the facts are slippery. Mm-hmm. And, it's and, not... and our desire might be one thing, and we, what we say would be another thing. I mean, we say A is B, but we're not saying I want A to be B because I have a lot of Bs. We're disguising our desire as a statement of fact. Uh huh. Oh, I'm sure a lot of that is yeah, going on. Of course on. Yeah. it goes yeah. on. Yeah. Most, of, most of politics is that. Yep. People disguise their desires as... Uh, as facts. As, as facts. You seem to be putting forth 
the principle of generosity as an epistemic conception of truth, according to which the truth cannot outrun our ability to know it. Of course there can be truths that we don't know. But I, Do, well, are you putting there, limits on truth, in other words, is the question. The truth cannot outrun our ability to know it. There are lots of truths that we don't know. Who knows them? Nobody yet. So there's a mind-independent truth? There is such a thing as mind-independent and language-independent truth? So that's you need point. language to express it, but you, you need something else to know it. Mm -hmm. Such as mind. Yeah, call it mind. Call it so, noose. Call it noose. Call it noose. Okay, so mind with a capital M. Yeah. Okay. So this is the objective mind, in a, in yeah, a sense. Yeah, it knows all things. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. So you don't want to get into ontology. You don't want to get into that. I don't want to. Okay. Fair enough. I guess we're done here then. Oh, thank God.